Welcome to Solarpunk Futures, a podcast brought to you by Android Press and Solarpunk Magazine. A Solarpunk Futures brings you short stories, poetry, nonfiction, analysis, and discussion about envisioning and building a new world where humanity, technology, and nature coexist in harmony rather than in conflict. I'm Brie Castagnazzi, the co-host of Solarpunk Futures and co-editor-in-chief of Solarpunk Magazine. And I'm Justine Norton Curtin, also co-host and co-editor-in-chief of Solarpunk Magazine. Welcome to Solarpunk Futures. Thank you for joining us for episode four of Solar Punk Futures. Unfortunately, my co-host Bree isn't able to be with us here for this episode, but she'll be back for episode five, and we've still got a really great show for you today. In a little bit, we're going to have a great discussion about carbon capture, reforestation, and solar punk art. But before we get to that, we want to update you on our Kickstarter campaign. It's been a really exciting month with this campaign. It's it's going amazing. We're only $1,300 away from having all six of our 2022 issues funded. And we're holding out hope that we will end even higher and hit our bonus issue stretch goal. We've got five days left in the campaign, so there's plenty of time for us to get there. We have a lot of really cool perks that are still around, including climate action sticker slap packs, seats in our utopian world building workshop, annual subscriptions to our magazine, of course, an online meet and greet with amazing science fiction and fantasy author Nisi Shaw, and quite a bit more that's still left. So get over to our Kickstarter campaign before your chance is gone. You can get there from our Twitter page, uh, from our Instagram page, you can get there from our website, solarpunkmagazine.com. However you get there, get over there before it's too late. Well, moving on, we've got a piece of news that we are really happy to share. Our publisher, Android Press, signed contracts this past weekend for a two-book deal with author and editor Phoebe Wagner. Wagner edited the seminal solar punk anthology, Sun Vault, Stories of Solar Punk and Eco Speculation, published by Upper Rubber Boot Books. She also has a forthcoming anthology with West Virginia University Press that's titled Almanac for the Anthropocene, a Compendium of Solar Punk Futures. Her short story, Children of Asphalt, was published earlier this year in the Multi-Species Cities Anthology that was released by World Weaver Press. We're really excited about this, if we didn't say that already. Both of the books are going to be solar punk projects, so we will be sure to keep you updated about what's going on as more information becomes available. In other new book news, according to Publishers Marketplace Deal Report, climate fiction author Sim Kern recently signed a three-book deal with Stellaform Press. The Young Adult Trilogy will kick off in the fall of 2022 with the novel Seeds of the Swarm, in which college students discover a terrible secret about the future climate tech they're researching, and they turn on the school's billionaire backers. Sounds good to me. Sounds like a fun book. Sounds like something we should keep our eye on, and we're going to. Don't worry about that. Like the other news we've had, we will keep you in the loop as we are able to get more information about these cool projects. Okay, well, we're really excited about our discussion today. We are going to talk now with Ishan Wong, who is the founder and CEO of Terraformation, a Hawaii-based startup dedicated to solving climate change through accelerating native forest restoration worldwide over the next decade. Prior to Terraformation, Ishan was the CEO of Reddit, and he's held various engineering and management positions at both Facebook and PayPal. Ishan, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? So far, so good. It's Friday, so I can't complain. And I'm yeah, right. Well, thanks for being here on the show with us. We're, we're really excited to talk with you. 
Um, so let's just jump into it. Uh, so, we, I mean, I guess let's start by just talking about when and how you first became aware of solar punk and like the whole, the whole phenomenon. Well, I, I don't know when I found it. It wasn't like a you know moment of discovery. I've sort of been aware of it as a genre. And it's one of those things where you're aware of something, and then later you're aware of the name for it, right? There, oh, yeah. right? You, you have these visions of the future, um, and and I had noticed, right? Like as a kid who had read a lot of science fiction, and you know, when you, and and grown up with films and books and whatever that I had in fact noticed that around the turn of the century, sci-fi media and depictions of the future became decidedly dark. And, and at first it was like a kind of welcome change I had noticed, right? Because like, I, I think the last great sci, you know, sci-fi trend was like the Star Trek Next Generation. And that's still really like utopian, right? That's like, hey, we've evolved to be these great people. Like we don't have money or whatever. Yeah. Um, and then around the turn of the century, I love being with so old that I say the turn of the century. Uh, <laughs> you know, there were these like gritty depictions of the future, and people were like, "Oh, that's so original, right?" It's no longer about this like perfect utopian future. Mm -hmm. You know, it's sort of confronting the, the gritty reality of human nature, right? And so there, there are a few of those, and I noticed that. And then like, it just stayed that way. I mean, every movie, you know, new thing that's mm -hmm. produced about the future is always some. It, it's, it's like this dystopian thing. Yep. Right, like, I don't remember. I don't know if people remember like the late '90s or something. There was like Stargate, like SG. -1. Oh yeah, uh huh. Totally. Even that was still like pretty positive. Sure. Right, that was like okay, you know, we're fighting like whatever aliens or whatever, right? But that that was still positive. But now it's just like everything in the future is bleak, and we're facing down like the worst aspects of our human nature. Mm -hmm. We just have better computers and lasers, right? <laughs> and true. and after a while, um, that became the whole thing, right? And so now positive depictions of the future are, well, they were either relegated to be naive um, or, uh, yeah, or like maybe childlike, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, like cartoons. Um, but that's something that was like missing. I think there's a, there's a younger generation that's grown up and all of their sci-fi media has been negative. Right. Um, to them, they, they've never known this era of sort of bright, forward-looking depictions of the future. And given that many of the real life, you know, projections of the future are negative, uh, I think yes. just bringing that back and seeing that again, and then finding out there's a name for it, right? It's like, okay, now there's a sure. name. It's like, what is that aesthetic that I like? It's like, it's all solar punk. Yeah. It's like, all right, I can get with that name. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, nice, yeah. nice to have something to call it. Yeah, like, it was like, the name was something recent, but I've sort of kind of felt that sort of thing because I grew up, at least sure. in my earlier childhood, thinking of like sci-fi or the future as like hope, right? We can improve mm -hmm. ourselves, things will be better. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and Star Trek, I think, is a perfect example. I mean, it started out as this totally utopian and very ho like hopeful, you know, at first, like really slapstick even, but you know, always yeah. like hopeful and looking to the stars and humanity has like essentially like perfected itself socially. Uh, but, and then nowadays, I mean, and I still, I still watch all of the Star, the new Star Trek shows. And, and there's, there's definitely still like hope there and like a sense of optimism, but they're definitely a lot darker and, and, yeah. and more dystopian uh, and um, much more of like, this the more kind of like seedy side of the federation and things like that um so <laughs> section 31 uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i mean it's 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 sort of leaked in everywhere and and i know uh kim stanley robinson um is is running around um the author talking a lot about sort of like dystopia fatigue and and um, not being mm -hmm. afraid of the word utopia and the need for more positive and optimistic stories um so that's that's really good because he's and he's he's gotten quite a bit of I mean, he's been in like CNN, Financial Times, um, and other papers doing you know, op eds on the topic. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. His new book is Ministry for the Future, right? Yeah, yeah, that's like his big yeah. one that is the most popular. He's got another one called New York Twenty One Forty that is pretty cool and, and hmm. pretty, pretty solar punk. Oh, cool! I actually yeah. checked them out. I keep yeah, hearing, them, but I haven't had the time to. It's good. Yeah, it's like you know i mean new york city how like half of the city is flooded because of climate change and so like people surviving and adapting and it's it's a right. good book yeah 
Um, well, and and so you're you're running a, a contest, a solar punk art contest. Um, so I wanted to talk about that a little bit. I mean, I'm curious, first of all, like if you're an artist yourself or just like appreciate art and, and you know, like what was sort of, did you have some kind of personal motivation to do this contest or what brought it about? Um, I am what I call a pretty good drawer. Nice. Uh, you, it's better you know, than I, mean, I do. You know like that, right? Like people who are good at drawing, but uh -huh. who aren't quite ready to call themselves artists. Totally. People say, oh, you draw really well. I'm like, yeah, I'm a good drawer. Um, <laughs> so I, I can draw. Um, if people search around online, they will find examples of my art, and it is okay. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say I'm much more an appreciator of art. Um, yeah. I. So I mean, my motivation for for the art contest is really just like I want to see more of it, right? I think that there's probably a lot of you know there there are people who currently make solo punk art. And there's probably a bunch of artists who could make it, right? Sure. Or familiar with that. And, you know, uh, I wasn't able to, like, make it a huge prize. So I just, like, did what I could. And hopefully it will motivate um, some people to make solo punk art. Um, I would like to be able to pay people well for it, right? Because this could, it could push the movement forward, I, I think. Sure. I think it's really important just to have uh, visions of the future. That are optimistic mm -hmm. um because you know people are really compelled by like if you know the future can be like this you will consciously or subconsciously work towards it right mm -hmm. you, you have to see it um and you know i'm an engineer so i think when i was younger i didn't really understand the importance of art and inspiring people and like sure. painting into the future but now it's like something i've grown to learn and it's just like yeah we have like we're bombarded with so much media and more media should be out there that is um technological um pro earth green right and like speaks to our ability to solve problems with cooperation and ingenuity and i think yeah. just like visualizing that world is important for sure yeah and and there's just something about visual art that you know i mean s stories are great and and really inspiring in their own way but there's something about like you know seeing it that i don't know it's, it helps you visualize it. That's a weird way to, way to put it. Yeah. That's obvious, but um, it sort of like gets into your brain in a way that just like hearing something doesn't necessarily. Um, yeah, it makes it, it real. It, yeah, yeah, it's much more real. more real. Yeah, for sure. That's a good way to put it. Um, so, so how's the contest going? I mean, I know I have seen, uh, I've seen it shared a number of places, um, a number of different blogs, and in a number of different places where. Um, people kind of congregate submission calls. Um, so I know that it's definitely gotten people's attention, but are you, I mean, are you getting a lot of submissions? Is it like, like overwhelming or just like a good steady flow or how's it, how's it going? Um, I will say that I wish I were doing a better job of promoting it, which is mm -hmm. something I'm not very good at. So mm -hmm. anyone is interested, please help promote this. Um, I'm getting a moderate number of submissions. That's good. Good. So, good. Yeah, it's not, it's not like a flood, but I am getting like, let me, let me check. They all go to a folder and I put them all. Yes, <laughs> I, would say, I would say I have a moderate number of submissions. Um, some of them are really impressive. Um, nice. One of them is a VR world. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, whoa. <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah, someone made a VR world. Uh, so any format is welcome. Um, I think some people mentioned like, hey, it, you know, like pen and ink drawing, is that, is that all, that all right? It's, it's like, yeah, like any art, um, any medium. In fact, I am very interested and impressed at the different types of medium uh, that people might, might contribute uh, or send in an entry about, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The VR thing, wow, that sounds really awesome. Yeah, um. I, I do think that that's a really promising <laughs> Like I have noticed many of the VR games and worlds that depict the future are definitely dystopian. Sure. Um, a, a solar punk themed VR world would be incredible. Yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm ready for that. Um, I mean, I guess, th so this will air, a, uh, well, a number of days, a good week before the contest ends. Um, so it's quickly, or well, not quickly, but, um, are there any other guidelines that you want to like throw out there for people to be aware of if they're thinking about submitting something other than uh, what you just talked about? 
you, you, yeah, I'm, I am actually considering like extending the deadline. Um, oh, that's just, nice. You know, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just really interested in people's creativity. Uh, <laughs> so far, it's just one. A lot of times, people ask me, "Hey, can we do this? Like, can I send more than one submission?" Right? And it's like, "Yeah, absolutely." Like, Jeez. I want to see like everyone's visions, and 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 it's really actually opened my eyes to the variety of ways hmm. that one can look at this. Right? It isn't just like solar panels and trees. Right? There's sure. a whole bunch of different things, and that's that's been really awesome. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I can't wait to see what comes out of it. Um, and we're excited too, because you know the magazine, as you know at least, uh, and uh, some a lot of the listeners probably do too, because we've talked about it before. But um, we'll be we'll be publishing one of the pieces as as one of our covers um, next year once once we're up and and putting out issues. So we're we're really excited about that, and can't can't wait to see which piece it ends up being. Um, are there? I guess uh, have, have you? Well, maybe. In, and maybe you haven't looked at the at many of the submissions yet. Obviously, you've looked at some of them, um, but are there any like kind of like maybe general themes that you've seen to the submission so far, or even just like I mean, without giving away what has been submitted? Oh like, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm that's trying like not particularly to... like whoa, that was so. Yeah, cool. I, I try not to actually <laughs> look at them too much because yeah. I don't want subject myself to any recency bias when i'm judging sure. them so i just sort of like good. glance over at them a bit when mm -hmm. they come in and then i'm just like okay i'm gonna leave them all here and then i'll look at them all at once sure. um that's good. i would say uh <laughs> i can't say that there's any common theme other than solar punk sure well that's actually sense. good yeah i think that's yeah so great. people don't feel constrained right yeah. it's not like all robots or anything mm -hmm. um so yeah yeah, that, I like that. And that's sort of, uh, I mean, I don't know how widely the debate has been or is being had, but I know it's something that is being talked about, at least in some corners of the like, broader solar punk community. Um, just the idea of like how, how tightly or loosely the term and the genre mm -hmm. should be defined or not. And like, especially with there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of emphasis already on like decentralization and things like that in the movement. Mm -hmm. And so... I think for a lot of people, the idea of like being really constrained by like official definitions or manifestos or anything like that is like, yeah, not the best idea, um, which I tend to agree with that. Um, but I also understand people's, a lot of people feel a need to like contain things and define them and under, to, you know, to help understand um, yeah. where, th where things fit in relation to other things. It's, it's not necessarily bad. Um, right. But well, the, the punk part of it is like sort of anti-rule. Totally. Get, yes. Right? <laughs> yes. So, yes. so I'm not going to like enforce that like <laughs> really strict, you know, rules about it. It's just yep. like, hey, is it is it an optimistic view of the future? Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. A lot of tech, a little tech, whatever. I don't know. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's all about ex exploring the possibilities anyway. So. Yeah. So then um, I'm curious if you have, I mean, maybe it's too early to even ask because you're I mean, you're still kind of in the middle of this contest but do you have any any like ideas or plans for any similar type things in the future other art contests or different kind of medium or something like that um yes i, I would actually like to continue this i would like to make it a regular thing nice um yeah i'm, I'm waiting to see how this goes right like sure. what is the exception to it um and because I did find when I announced it, it like there were a lot of people who are not artists who were just very supportive of this. Right? <laughs> there, there, are, like all the people who donated prize money. Sure. Right? Yes, this is what I want to see. Um, my friend Diego, who runs Pachama, mm -hmm. um, is a, is a really big solar punk fan, and he's like, yeah, we need more of positive vision of the future i think there's a lot of people who support this and want to see more of it um so i, sure. I think what you said about like dystopia fatigue <laughs> is real like, i'm tired of things being crappy yeah right? like, yep. so, and i like i like that phrase because i like you know i like i like dystopian stories like you know like the matrix is one of my favorite movies and and dystopian stories too they have a lot of them have like that element of hope you know like there's people fighting against the evil corporate you know yeah. whatever it is or the, the alien overlords or whatever it happens to be but it's still just yeah. not like it doesn't have that super optimistic undertone you know that this right. solar punk has but anyway right. sorry 
Yeah, like when the first gritty sci-fi first started, that was a, like, now we're addressing some realities of human nature. And I think that, yep. that is important. It is important. Um, I actually sort of think that like DS9 was like a really good balance. <laughs> if we're going to like nerd out about the, the Star Treks, right? Like yes. they were like, it was kind of gritty, but they mm -hmm. were still the Federation trying to be good. Yep. Right? Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now you're, that's yeah. my language for sure. That's my favorite Star Trek series. Uh -huh. uh, and it, <laughs> in fact, you can't see it because it's blurry here, but I've got a big, huge poster of uh, of Cisco in the station on my wall behind me. Whoa, okay. Uh, that's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 45 year old with posters on his wall. <laughs> um, but yeah, it is. I mean, it's definitely took a darker turn from the next generation uh, mm. in, in the original series. Um, and it's, I mean, it was also really cool because it was sort of, there may have been a show that did it before them, but kind of the beginning of like long form storytelling in TV mm -hmm. like with yeah. the, the second half of the series where they, they had the big long Dominion War arc. Yeah, um, so that's it's, it's a, it was a groundbreaking show. I could we could I could do a whole hour, <laughs> yeah we could go on hours on that. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean I think that's um, I mean anything else that you want to say about the art contest? I, I want to talk to you some about uh, the the company that you you started somewhat recently at least. Um, but any, I mean anything else you want to say for folks about the art contest? Um spread the news to as many artists as you know and definitely encouraging submissions so yeah yeah definitely. the world yeah. wants to see your art yeah right we do yes Seriously. there are people hungering for this yep. so it's yeah we'll, we'll definitely be be plugging it uh quite a bit in the next couple weeks uh i mean even if you end up extending it mm -hmm. um but yeah we want to we want to see it do well so um okay well so you um you have this company called terraformation that is doing some pretty cool stuff uh and i'm generally speaking from um from what i've gathered uh the mission is uh, essentially helping to reforest a ton of land like mm -hmm. a billion acres uh, to, you know to help avert climate change through climate capture and sequestration but it's it's like more more detailed and involved in that what is it that terraformation is doing in like the reforestation world and like the, the role it's seeking to play in that process okay um so from a practical immediately applicable standpoint if you want to draw down carbon and you want to do a lot of it the answer is clearly trees or more precisely restoring native forests by which you begin by planting, you know, anchor species of trees. So it comes back down to planting trees. You just have to plant sure. the correct species and you have to, there's all these things you have to do. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to do a lot of it. And I'm focused on that because like, I'm, I'm also a very practical engineer, right? It's like, how do I really solve this problem, mm -hmm. right? And, and so, so it isn't really about, well, in theory, we have this proposal or whatever. It's like, okay, I want to start solving the problem right now. Yeah, right? what'll work, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, remove CO2 molecules from the atmosphere. So we, that's by far the most cost-effective solution and it's the most scalable and you can do it right now. Mm -hmm. um, because I think with climate actually, uh, people forget that climate investments or climate solutions aren't just a matter of oppor lost opportunity cost if you wait, mm -hmm. it's actually debt, right? Like the planet mm -hmm. is warming, right? If you do something right. that you can come now, it's it's warming so the, the problem is getting worse over time so so starting now is much more important than it normally would be for other projects um and many organizations and people um already do understand this and are working on it right their projects planting millions of trees now um uh, many of them are focused on native species native forest restoration although i think there still needs to be a lot more education about how to do that because you know native uh restored forests become resilient and self-sufficient. Um, whereas, you know, na naively you might think, oh, we'll just find the fastest growing species of tree and like plant huge plantations. Right. Millions of them, yeah. Yeah, and that turns out not to work. Um, we, you know, we collectively as mankind learned that painful lesson over the last 30 or 40 years. But now we know how to do it correctly. And so, so there's organizations doing that. And so the remaining question 
actually, which is one that is not directly confronted by many people because they don't, they aren't actually fully aware, is like, how do you scale this to like a planetary uh, degree, mm -hmm. right? right. Um, how do you do this big enough? Because every climate solution will actually need to scale to this level. Um, I think that's that's also just not recognized, uh, right? Like you, you can create this like nice climate capturing machine or something in the lab. And then you realize, oh, well, we have to build like 40,000 different things. Yeah, like, you can't just right. put it in a park in Los Angeles and think. Yeah, it's just, problem. it's not good anymore. <laughs> All right. And so, so with forestation, um, one really nice thing is even though pe people say like, oh, trees take a long time to grow, they take 10 to 20 years to grow. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing that is unique to this is that it is massively parallelizable. Like in theory, we really could plant a trillion trees all at the same time. So although it would take 10 to 20 years for each tree to mature, if we had the proper organizations and organization and logistics in place, it's extremely parallelizable. It's possible to get this done by the end of the decade. Mm -hmm. And it, it is not that is not the case for many other solutions because the you know the, the supply chain and parts are sure. just like harder to do mm -hmm. like at that scale. But trees, they're already everywhere, right? They're a proven technology. Right. Um, you know, there's, there's like localized variants in every country, right? Like if, if mm -hmm. I told you I invented this like um, <laughs> carbon sequestration machine that was self-replicating and only needed <laughs> sun and water, you'd be like, whoa, people would okay, throw money at you, yeah. Yeah, exactly, right? But it's there, right? Like, right. There's one outside my window, um, several actually. Uh, and, and so the question really is scale and scalability mm -hmm. is a relatively new practice because it has only been in the recent, I would say 20 years, where people have consciously engaged in taking working solutions and scaling them by a factor of a billion. Right. And, and a lot of that has been done in the tech industry, right? Like you see these companies just appear out of, out of nowhere, right? Like overnight. Right. And it's because there are people who know how to scale systems yeah. as a special practice. And, and to date, people who have expertise in or work on scalability have generally been in like, a separate circle of the Venn diagram from the people who are working on, uh, you know, organizations that are working on restoring forests. Right. That have, that have scaled, they, they've actually become very large, but they've scaled somewhat slower. Mm -hmm. And so what we're trying to do is apply the practice of scalability to accelerate this worldwide effort. Mm -hmm. And so an important thing there is, um, we are not gonna do it ourselves, right? Like often our mission statement is like, Planet trillion trees, right? right? But this company is not gonna do it ourselves. What sure. we want to do is make it so that everyone together can do this and we help identify scalability bottlenecks beforehand, overcome them so that as more and more people are getting involved, people are doing more and more, we don't hit a wall. Mm -hmm. um, because like we have to do this at a scale that's unprecedented, but it right. is possible, right? Mm -hmm. um, I say I generally say like this it's an extremely, extremely difficult task, but every other solution is more difficult. Right, right. <laughs> so well, um, and, so, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, well and there's something cool. there's something about this too. Uh, I mean, it's it's a very solar punk solution, I think, in the sense that um it's really community oriented, right? And it, it recognizes that like one person or one company can't necessarily just come in and solve the problems or be the superhero that like it's you know this is it's a global problem and it's really going to take all of us cooperating and working on the solution together and each of us has our part mine might be planting some trees while yours is you know building seed banks or, or whatever it happens to be but you know we're all we all got to be in on it together or else it's not yes. gonna work. <laughs> yeah yeah this is i i do sometimes say this is like the most inclusive climate change solution hmm. And and that you know inclusivity is kind of a political buzzword now, nowadays, sure. but um, yeah. I think it's it's actually really real because uh, some solutions you know the, the very high tech ones require a high technology base, and that mm -hmm. actually implies that there's re a relatively small group of people or countries that have the technology base to work on that, mm -hmm. um, and and that's that's fine except that if you have a scale solution that has to work, you can't. It can't be like subject to say the risk of a macroeconomic dislocation in a particular yeah. country <laughs> delivering that solution, right? Sure. Um, and so restoring native forests is actually something that almost everyone can be involved in. Like, mm -hmm. you know, if you can think of a 
country like Tanzania, it does not have the technological base to build a direct air capture system. But it does have the social and economic base to restore 100 million trees. Sure. Like 10 million acres of forest, right? Every country can participate. Everyone can do it. Sometimes it's discouraging to people where it's like, well, I planted a tree. Okay, what did that do, right? But making a sustained effort to scale is something that everyone, every group, every country can do. And I think that makes it much more, it, you know, we're all in this together. We're solving a global problem. Um, everyone can contribute. And if someone falls short, someone else can step in and fill sure. that gap. Right? I think that's that's really important. That, that's the, the resilience. And, and I think successfully doing this um, is one of those, you, you know how like, you go on a journey and you accomplish something, you also change yourself. You grow. Oh, sure. I think this will be a journey of growth mm-hmm. for the human race if we accomplish this, right? It's like, wow, we can accomplish this big thing by working together, but we didn't have to coerce anyone. Right. Right. And like everyone was able to contribute, right? I, I think that that's, um, I think it's, it's like the underrated and underrecognized part of that. Yeah, really. I mean, I honestly never particularly thought about it like that. Um, just like the potential for 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 growth and I guess for lack of a better word, like evolution as the human species that could come out of like the kind of cooperation that it will take to really solve the problem. Um, that's awesome. <laughs> I like that a lot. Um, I was curious to go, oh yeah, you had mentioned, um, so talking about planting um, lots of trees that are all the same type and just doing sort of like massive uh, monoculture tree farms. Um, what is it about those that that don't work? I mean, like you said, that would be like the easiest and simplest thing, but why why do those types of projects tend to fail? I, I th- so I think there's like a sort of fundamental orientation around thinking about trees as a solution mm. that hasn't become obvious until more recently which is that trees are not the unit of carbon sequestration forests are well right and this leads to a bunch of different thinking like uh so so one of the objections you might hear about tree planting as a solution is like trees are not it's not permanent carbon storage when the tree dies the co2 is re-released into the atmosphere right you're only sequestering it for 50 to 100 years well right um but that changes if you think of the unit of sequestration as being the forest because what actually happens is when a tree dies it does decompose some of the co2 goes in the soil some of it is re-released however the decomposition is slow after about four years the tree is about 50 percent decomposed after about 10 years it's about 80 percent decomposed so it's it's very slow yeah Um, in that time as the co2 is re-released uh it is taken up by all the other plants and trees in the forest, including the offspring of that tree, yeah. right? Like many, many trees, you know, in fact, seed multiple offspring sure. over its lifetime. And so in fact, there is, there's a, you know, net positive replacement rate, right, mm-hmm. for trees. And if, and so the second point when we talk about native forest survival, um, if you have the forest continuing to deepen and grow, it is in fact, over time, taking in carbon, it's released when the plants die, but then it's retaken up by the other plants and trees. Right. Um, and forests are very long lived. Like you, forests, you know, you have forests that are like hundreds of thousands of years old. There's some forests that are billions of years old. Yeah. That's a very permanent carbon sink. <laughs> yeah, right. That's so, not just the first, right. <laughs> like there's this there's permanent. Um, and, and so you have to sort of think of it now as uh, previously people thought of carbon sequestration of trees in terms of like, how big is the tree? How many trees? And, and that's a time, that's like a time agnostic way of thinking of, <laughs> about it. And what we want is actually the longest duration, right? We want, and so if you think of it in terms of time, um, then your goal becomes uh, trees growing to maturity and creating, it's a self-sustaining ecosystem. Yeah. And that, uh, the way to do that is you need to restore using a ver- variety of biodiverse set of native species. Um, because what actually happens the, in the forest is like uh, other organisms feed off of the byproducts of the mm-hmm. tree. Um, 
And native species can support an order of magnitude more species than a non-native species. This is actually the key because, um, and, and so it's like insects, bacteria, fungi, birds, mm -hmm. right? Like animals, right. shrubs, grasses, they, they all like feed off of the byproducts of the tree. And the whole native species thing is not actually an authenticity or anti-colonialist argument. It's, it's purely practical. And it's because those species co-evolved with that species of tree over millennia, mm -hmm. right? The thousands of years that that species was there before we came and had right. the job down, right? All of that life is still there. And so what that means is, you know, all life is carbon. And think of it as like, you're actually trying to maximize long-term biomass storage mm -hmm. of carbon. Um, and so what that does is native tree species create a much denser and deeper ecosystem with more of the ecological niches filled with species that's what makes the ecosystem self-sustaining. Right. Um, so it's more resistant to, you know, environmental perturbation, you know, which is going to sure. increase. So it's going to be more and more important. And so that's sort of the, I guess we would call like the key difference. Mm -hmm. And the thing that we collectively as humans learned over the past, uh, you know, 30, 40, it was 30, 40 years of like painful, like, uh, failed <laughs> tree planting programs, right? Where they planted like huge plantations of eucalyptus. Like, wow, they're growing. And then like 10 years later, they all die because of some minor like right. disease or something yeah, like that. Yeah, a fungus or something that just spreads. Yeah, and they're just all gone. And it's not about counting the trees and their biomass. It's the entire ecosystem. Because you can have a species of tree die from a forest, in, in a forest. But if there's a whole ecosystem there, those niches are rapidly refilled with other right. species. Right. Yeah, the so, forest stays. I mean, it's really, it's pretty simple, really. I mean, it's it's like the whole, just the whole, well, one like circle of life thing that we learn in like basic biology, like web of life. Um, yeah. But then two, just like, and for as much as like inclusivity and, and things and words like that are, are like political buzzwords nowadays, I can just the idea that like communities, whether they're communities of trees or animals, people, whatever, are stronger when you know, there's, there's real diversity. <laughs> yeah. So, um, every, cool. Yeah. Every different, uh, individual or population like helps fill in for, for everyone else. Yep. Exactly. Um, well, um, is there any, we're almost out of time. Um, but is there anything else that you want, uh, folks who are listening maybe to know about the company or like where, you know, where people can go to, to read more about it themselves and, and what you all are doing or, uh, well, you know, most of our information is, you know, terraformation.com. We are doing a crowdfunded uh, equity raise. The securities laws recently changed so that startups can raise money from non-accredited retail investors. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's really good. And you know, some, some companies use it just because they want to crowdfund. In our case, we received a lot of institutional venture investment. However, mm -hmm. we also believe that climate change is everyone's problem. And, and everyone, you know, so many people want to participate, but also if, if we are successful, we would prefer for that to be shared amongst a much, much larger group of people rather than just wealthy institutional investors. Sure. And so we're doing this crowd raise for, you know, a portion of the equity at the same terms um, as our recent Series A raise. Hmm. So that's also something you can find on our website. Yeah, that's cool. Um, but beyond that, I guess what I want to say is like, this is like a message for young people who may be listening, which is that all your life you may have lived in an atmosphere of disaster and, you know, terror, right? Like there, there was, first there was terrorism, then there was climate, then there was COVID, and when COVID's done, there's still going to be climate, all right? And, and many young people have grown up in a really, really negative and discouraging world where the message to them has been that they cannot change the future and that we are doomed. And that is not the case. You know, the message is that they're, they're powerless, that the systems in place keep them from doing anything. And I'm here to tell you that, no, those old systems are starting to break down because they don't fit the reality of the new world. And the people who, you know, run those systems today. Those systems were fine for the past, but they were built by the ancestors, the parents and grandparents of the people who run them today. And those people who run them today don't know what they're doing and they're scared. And I know this because I talk to those people. <laughs> right. And 
that young people today have power and that they should also be aware that over time their power grows, it does not diminish. They grow in experience and resources and wisdom. And the people who run the old system are aging. So what is required now is sustained commitment. You may feel that the one thing you are doing today is a drop in the bucket, it isn't gonna help. It isn't gonna help. But if you commit to doing more and more of it, and I, I usually say like 10X scaling per year. If you, if you can commit to doing 10 times more of whatever helpful thing you did today, this year, next year, and then 10 times more the year after that, it will make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. It will result in massive scale, right? You, you know, you might think, like, oh, well, you know, how do I do like 100,000, like six years from now? Okay, okay but in, you have six years to figure that out. Sure. And so by the end of the decade, that can be a tidal wave of, <laughs> tidal wave is like an uncomfortable term when it comes to like climate change. <laughs> sure. Right? Let's purely <laughs> make <laughs> a great wave <laughs> of change, right? And that young people can make the world into what they dream it to be and what it should be. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to say that, that there is hope. That is part of what solar punk is intended to express. But it is also like, you know, they're more powerful and more well networked than any generation in the past. And prior generations did great things. And so I think this generation will as well. So. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate that. I think that's a it's all, all very true and we need more uplifting messages like that. Um, and it's a really great, uh, really great statement to end the interview on. Uh, so thank you very much, Ishan, for, for being on the show and talking with us. Um, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, we wish you a lot of luck with, with both Terraformation, um, obviously, because we really need, <laughs> we really need that to work. Um, but in the, the art contest too, um, we're really excited about that. Can't wait to see uh, the winning pieces and and what comes out of that for sure so thanks for joining us oh thank you for having me have a good one you too have a great weekend and aloha yeah aloha all right everyone thank you for joining us for today's episode thanks again to ishan wong for joining us and having a great discussion with us about reforestation native forests that the really great solar punk art contest that he is hosting don't forget that ends uh the submission period ends on november 1st so get your solar punk art submissions in before the deadline hits and we will see you next time uh, we'll be back in two weeks with another great episode of solar punk futures until then Get out there, demand utopia, and let's build a solar punk future together. Bye. You've been listening to the Solar Punk Futures Podcast, a production of Android Press, brought to you by Solar Punk Magazine. To hear more episodes or learn more about Solar Punk Magazine, visit www.solarpunkmagazine.com.